Okay, uh, I want to introduce myself. So I'm Dan Repich of DSR Corporation, uh, Partner Relations and New Business Director. And today I'm going to give just a short presentation on the future of digital identity, which is self-sovereign identity and blockchain. Okay, so a little bit about DSR. Uh, doing software right, you can see here on the back of my shirt, uh, DSR has been in business for more than 25 years. And we've been in the blockchain and SSI space for more than eight years. We've contributed to more than 75 open source projects. Uh, we've been a member of Hyperledger Aries, Sovereign, Open Wallet, and Distributed Technology Groups also. So a little bit about digital identity models. We can compare some of these identity models to SSI. So first, the silo approach, which is essentially a person talking SSL directly to an organization. And then uh, common with many corporate approaches is the third party federated identity. And once authorized, the user does not have to provide their credentials again for resources under that entity, but rather employees can access multiple accounts across different domains using a common set of credentials. In both of these approaches, the agreement holder or entity is at the center of authorizing those credentials in SSL. The holder of the credentials is at the center. So that is the difference with self-sovereign identity. You are in control of your information. And you you decide who that information goes to. Okay, so a little bit more about SSI. Uh, as we can see in this picture, SSI is decentralized and the individual is in control of their own information associated with their identity. In addition, SSI can work peer to peer and there's no need for a centralized intermediaries. There's no need for passwords. Users hold their own data and decide who they want to share it with. So with self-sovereign identity, the holder of the identity is at the center of the exchange. And we can see here in this picture, uh, with federated identity, the identity holder is authorizing a verifier or a client to access the information on your behalf. So here's an example of a use case. Uh, this is a common use case about Alice, who's a passport holder. So Alice, she installs a mobile uh, wallet app, which then she can store a government ID or passport. And then when she gets to the airport, she can present her digital ID to the TSA. Alice is in control of what parts of her identity get presented to the other identities. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about how this works here in the next slide. So here's some examples of issuers, verifiers, and wallets. So not only governments can issue, but businesses as well. Wallets can be mobile, cloud, or hybrid. Again, selective disclosure means that you are in charge of what you present as part of your identity. Uh, there's no need for every entity that needs your identity to have all parts of it. And we're gonna, we're gonna go a little deeper into this here in a minute. So in SSI, there are two important concepts. One, the verifiable credentials. These originate with the issuer and they're maintained by the holder, right? And they're passed to a verifier for verification against a verifiable data registry. A DID or decentralized identifier is a unique ID that's passed from a holder and resolved against the verifiable data registry or VDR to produce a DID document which then contains presentation items. Okay, so some more technical concepts. What's a verifiable credential? Um, it's a set of one or more claims made by an issuer. It's a tamper evident credential with authorship that can be cryptographically verified and used to build verifiable presentations. Uh, this is also known as a certificate. Okay, so what, what do we have inside of a DID? So basically a DID is, is like a GUID, right? It's a unique identifier. So any subject can be represented by a DID. They're decoupled from centralized registries, identity providers, and certificate authorities. 
Now, so DRDs, DIDs, they're like URIs, uh, resource indicators that uh, they associate a DID subject with the DID document, allowing a trustable interaction with that subject. So and what's a DID document? It's, it's a set of data describing the DID subject, including the mechanisms such as cryptographic public keys that the DID subject or DID delegate can use to authenticate itself and prove its association with the DID. I know there's a lot there. And then what's the verifiable data registry? So the verifiable data registry is basically, it facilitates uh, the creation, the verification, the updating, or deactivation of these DIDs. So the, the DID basically goes and gets resolved against the verifiable data registry. And this can also be on a uh, blockchain. So here's a diagram of kind of how the flow works, right? If we assume that the holder has a public and private key pair, then this key is linked to a DID1, including the public part in the corresponding DID document. The DID and the DID document are then published to a verifiable data registry, uh, such as a distributed ledger, right? So here, the DID is published. And then the issuer, which is here, such as a government, uh, could be a business, uh, that credential is signed by a key associated with DID1. Both the DID1 and the DID2 are included in the same credential. The, issue, uh, the issuer may also require the holder to prove ownership of the holder's keys, but the verifiable credential is then sent to the holder and stored in the holder's wallet. So this is the flow. And this is really ends up being a certificate. And now the holder has this in their wallet. So now when the verifier requests proof from the holder, the holder examines the wallet and selects the specific verifiable credentials that can satisfy the proof request. The holder can then create a verifiable presentation to send to the verifier. The verifier resolves the issuer's public keys associated with the issuer's DID using the VDR and verifies the signatures. And in this way, the holder is always in control of, of their, their, their personal credentials. <laughs> There's several layers to this stack, and you can see a lot of different corporations here in, in the exhibit hall that do these technologies. But um, essentially, the verifiable presentation is created by the holder, and it's sent to the verifier. And layer two is where the connections are made to share those credentials. And layer one is where an issuer puts a DID with a public key and the metadata into the verifiable data registry. The holder can also put identifiers to be associated with a credential on the verifiable data registry. So what technologies are involved in this? Uh, in all these layers? Well, it depends on what you want to accomplish. There are many choices that describe what is the VC format, the VC, how the VC exchange occurs, and what the DID methods may be needed to store information on the verifiable data registry. But there's a lot of options to implement this, right? So is what we can, is what we can see here, the VC format Exchange protocols and DID methods have many backing technology options. As you design your software, which of these is chosen is important for the type of transactions you want to provide and for future scaling. So these are the exchange protocols that you're going to use. This is the VC format, and these are the DID methods. So there's a lot of options, and you need to work with a software company that can actually explore those with you. There are some existing profiles already, as we can see, such as the European wallet, the EUID wallet, the Hyperledger Indy, Carry, and ISO MDL, which is already uh, used for driver's licenses. So how does blockchain fit into this? It is optional. It can be used in layer one as an option for storing DID and public keys or revocation registries and credential schemas in the VDR. 
but blockchain is never used to store verifiable credentials or private keys. Okay, now this is a short demo of how two Android phones work with a wallet. So a mobile wallet is installed on two Android phones in this demonstration. And we're going to show how we, you, a user can move their credentials between two phones without passwords. So in this wallet contains two credentials, right? A member card and service, a personal, personal information. We can see inside the wallet, we have both of these. So in the settings, we can go to the data management and choose the backup wallet option. So this is showing the credentials in the, uh, the Android phone to the left. There's two credentials in the wallet. And then we go to the settings and we do a backup wallet option under data management. Okay, so now we can see the wallet was successfully backed up. So now we go to the second Android phone, which has the same DSR wallet installed, and we authenticate with the existing passkey. And there's actually a fingerprint operation here that's not shown because Android uh, 12 will not let you record that fingerprint operation. Getting some feedback on stage. Okay. And maybe if I move this speaker away. Okay. Sorry about that. Sure, sure, sure. Testing, 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 testing. Is that better? <laughs> no, we're almost done anyways, but <laughs> anyways, uh, you know, just to end the presentation, on the second Android phone, you restore the, uh, the wallet, and then we can see that the credentials were passed from the first Android phone to the second Android phone without use of any kind of password. And so this is an example of how self-sovereign identity can be used to exchange credentials between wallets uh, without any password, and the user is in control of that information. Okay, and that's all. So if you need more information, uh, I'm welcome to give you my business card and we can hand that out and uh, we can get in touch with uh, our VP of architecture. Thank you. <laughs>